today to talk with you about alligator psychology. And the reason that I became an academic, wow, I wish I could see y'all's faces. Hi. The reason I became an academic was it had a lot to do with alligator psychology. I was a brand manager at Mattel, and Mattel is one of the companies that does more great market research, putting more resources into it than any other company. We had phenomenal facilities, great team, quantitative work, qualitative work, and I participated in so many research presentation discussions where the research team or my team would be presenting to senior management and we make a very good research-based case for where the company or the brand needs to move. And the executives ask good questions, they're engaged, and it feels like we're all on the same page. And then they just go with their gut in the end. And I would be frustrated, super, super frustrated. Have you ever had that frustration? Anybody? Yeah, a bunch of us, right? So, <laughs> so I ended up leaving Mattel and going to get my PhD to study decision making. My goal was I want to figure out how to help people make better decisions, decisions that make sense based on research, not going with their gut. What ended up happening as I learned more about psychology was I realized that we need to work better with people who make gut decisions because that's who we are. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. I first need a promise. We're in Florida. I know a lot of people here, and you're from many other places. A lot of people know the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. Raise your hand if you can see the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. These are gators. OK. Please promise me, if I show you a picture of a crocodile, we'll all pretend it's an alligator. OK? <laughs> OK. I'll take that laughter as a yes. First, a guessing game. Oops. This is like how many jelly beans in the jar, only it's M&Ms, and I'm going to ask you to predict the results of a field study research experiment that I conducted at Google, where I've been working with the food team. Do I have any Google people here this morning? Are they all hung over from last night's shenanigans? Well, I'm going to throw them under the bus then. At Google. It's a cornucopia of free food. It's nirvana of free food everywhere. And Googlers love, 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 love M&Ms. It's the most popular snack. And the Google food team asked me, please, our employees are fantastic, and they complain about gaining weight, and they eat thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of M&Ms. So how could we help them make healthy choices by accident? This is a picture of a break room where people are lined up for something, probably M&Ms. And this is what the M&M situation looks like in the break room. There are these opaque containers full of bulk M&Ms, and then there's a little cup. It's half cup size, four ounces, and you scoop as many M&Ms as you want into your cup. And then there's this label that says serving size 1.74 ounces, which is obviously completely useless because how much is 1.74 ounces? We have no idea. So a collaborator and I, working with the team, we said, OK, we're going to experiment with labels, and we're going to experiment with portions, trying to help people eat fewer M&Ms without telling them what to do, because we all hate to be told what to do. So the two labeling conditions, we had a numeric label, which for peanut M&Ms, it just said serving size eight pieces. OK, got it, right? We had the visual serving size label, which shows a picture of a cup and shows you how far to fill it if you want one serving size. And then we had the portions condition, where the label stays the same, but instead of bulk M&Ms inside that container, we put Fun Packs Halloween size candies. My collaborator and I had different hypotheses about what would work. Think in your own mind, which of these three conditions, if any, do you think impacted the amount of M&Ms that people ate? And did it make them eat more, or did it make them eat less? Just think about it silently for a moment. OK, keep it in your mind, and we'll come back to this particular gut decision. Alligator psychology. Those of you who have an interest in behavioral economics, 
We'll have heard of System 1 and System 2. I know Dan Ariely was here at TMRE not that long ago, and many of you will at least have bought Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman if you haven't read it yet. It, behavioral economics boils down to this in 30 seconds. We have two brains in our brain. Behavioral economists call these just very ungracefully System 1 and System 2. I refer to them as the alligator brain and the court. And what happens is the alligator brain, System 1, is this unconscious, fast, intuitive, automatic decision maker that makes almost all of our decisions. We imagine, though, that the court, our System 2 brain, is making a lot more decisions than it is, but the court is conscious, slow, deliberate, and effortful. Every time the court's got to make a decision, you've got to make arguments on both sides, hear all the evidence, the testimony, deliberate, and then make a decision. And you can't be doing other things with your brain while you're engaging the court or system two. You can think of system one like a first responder because it is, and system two is a second guesser, but we don't always second guess our decisions, only sometimes. Think about going to the grocery store. We don't think that we're making unconscious decisions when we grab food and we put it in our cart, but what if every single one of those decisions was made by the court? You would have to look at this brand compared to that brand, this, pair, this price compared to that one. Look at the nutritional information. What about the volume? What trade-offs do you want to make between sugar and preservatives? If we had to make even simple decisions, like what food to put in our grocery cart, with the court, we would never leave the grocery store. And the way humans operate is that we think that we're making these rational decisions when most of the time we're making decisions through habit, gut reflexes, and automatic behaviors that we have engaged in many, many times before, or rules that we have. Like at the grocery store, if your rule is you buy whatever orange juice brand is on sale, then you don't have to think about it. You don't have to take it to the court, and you can make that decision with your alligator brain. Here's something really freaky. Even the court makes decisions with the alligator brain. There was a study that came out a few years ago on uh, hundreds of Israeli judges. And these Israeli judges were hearing parole, were, they were listening to parole hearings. Criminals were coming up to say, I think I should get let out of jail. Judge gets to decide. That is a very difficult decision. In the morning, when the judges are awake and refreshed and their minds are clear, two-thirds of the criminals coming up for parole were released from jail. And so this is the court, right? That is the court making the decision. But gradually, as more decisions are made, the day wears on, frustrations, and just general feelings of depletion and even low blood sugar set in, decision-making shifts over to the alligator. And before lunch, zero prisoners are getting out on parole. They take a break at lunch, come back refreshed. Again, right after lunch, two-thirds of the prisoners getting let out on parole. And as they get depleted, the day wears on. By the end of the day, zero. If even the court even people who are paid only to make rational, fair decisions are making their decisions with the alligator brain, we got to just work with it. This is how the alligator brain decides what to do with the information that it receives. First of all, the alligator brain is super, super, super lazy and has a mandate to preserve cognitive resources, ignores everything unless it's new, or unless it stimulates curiosity. Your alligator brain wants to know what around might be dangerous, not just dangerous in terms of physical safety, which is probably how it evolved, but dangerous in terms of mental resources. When you find yourself tuning out during a presentation, that's because your alligator brain has decided this is dangerously complicated, takes too much in too much cognitive resources for the benefit that I'm going to get, and so I'm just going to be working on other things. 
The same thing if you think you know what the presenter is going to say. So think about that from your point of view as a presenter, right? So it, you need to be presenting what's new, stimulating curiosity, and making the case for this being important enough, not just to make the decision, but to have the crocod the alligator brain decide to focus energy and resources on it. Alligator understands emotional, Alligator has emotional reactions, and it takes in the big picture with broad strokes, looking at evidence and not at abstractions. This is why when we present data, lots of times we create a graph rather than using a table. It's not that our brains can't understand a table, but that's the court gets numbers, but it takes more resources. Alligator brain, if you visualize data, can totally get it like that without using any resources. And the alligator brain also can handle anything that comes as long as there's a relevant rule. Only sends to the court if it's unexpected or out of the ordinary. And I'll share with you some specific ways to think about working with and engaging the alligator brain since this is how we work. The first one is attention. Lots of times, life feels kind of like this, information overload, overwhelm, and it doesn't even matter what the messages are, they're not sinking in because we're just not giving them our attention. And this is the challenge that we face when we're trying to persuade other people and share our research, share our ideas, influence the people around us. Biggest, biggest first challenge is just getting their attention in the first place. And I want to share an example from Procter & Gamble. Anybody from Procter & Gamble currently or formerly in here? Hi, welcome. P&G coined the phrase moments of truth, and it's spread through much of our industry, right? And it's MOT, M-O-T, if you're in the know. Moments of truth refers to the idea that we need to reach people to influence them when they have the highest likelihood of being willing to say yes, or paying attention, or caring to what we have, caring about what we have to talk about. Bonux is a laundry detergent that's sold in Lebanon, and the P&G marketing team in Beirut was thinking, how do we reach people? How do we reach our consumers when it's going to be a moment of truth, and they'll be most likely to be thinking about and excited about laundry detergent? When are we thinking about and excited about laundry detergent? Detergent, never. Right? Except, like, you know, when you're doing laundry, at least you're thinking about it. But if you want to advertise to people who are doing laundry, TV advertising doesn't make sense because they're doing laundry. Print advertising doesn't make sense because they're doing laundry. Radio, you know, not really. In Beirut, when they're doing laundry, they live in high rise apartment buildings and they mostly have washing machines and they don't have dryers and they hang their laundry out to dry on the balconies. And the brilliant P&G marketing team figured out we can reach them <laughs> by advertising on the tops of buses. This is a brilliant moment of truth advertising campaign. Career Builder, the job search site, stole their idea for their own moment of truth. <laughs> Think about for yourself when you're trying to persuade another human being, when are they going to be most likely to be excited and most likely to say yes? And in particular, is that in the formal presentation or is it in a completely different conversation before or after? Moments of truth, time and place, very, very simple, but most often overlooked. Another way to engage attention is through what's technically called the Zygarnik effect. It's open loops, and it's related to curiosity. Bluma Zygarnik was a psychologist who in the 1920s was doing her PhD in Czechoslovakia, and she and her friends would go to this cafe where there was this one amazing waiter who could remember, no matter how big your table was, even if you had 15 people sitting there, every single person's drink order and food order, they would go around to tell him, and he would deliver them perfectly. And we've all had servers like this, right? So Bluma and her friends one day said, we're gonna quiz him 
So after he had brought all of the food and drinks to their large table, everybody put their napkin over their meal or their drink, and they called the waiter back, and they said, okay, tell us what we ordered. And he couldn't remember. He couldn't remember anybody's order. This waiter who was the most, had the most incredible memory, he couldn't remember their order. And the reason was that that open loop had been closed. Our brains have this natural drive to resolve anything that is left unresolved or open or uncertain. This drive toward resolution is the same reason why when we go to the movies, even if the movie really, really sucks, almost always we stay till the end, right? Like we never walk out of a movie, we just complain about it afterward because we can't, because it's a story and we need to know how it ends. This is an open loop. Clickbait, open loops, stimulating your curiosity, grabbing the attention of your alligator brain. You never cared before probably what Will Smith might think about his son saying he wants to remove something. Trump's IQ, Hillary's IQ, we don't know. I don't even trust the internet to tell us what it actually is, but it stimulates your curiosity even if you never cared. He thought it was Bigfoot's skull, but then experts told him this. <gasps> what could it be, right? Did Neanderthals die because they didn't have jackets? It's complicated. Not a question you have ever pondered, <laughs> but it creates an open loop. Like when you saw a movie and you're trying to remember the name of that actor, and you're going, what was the name of the actor? What was the name of the actor? And your brain, thank God for the internet, right? Because otherwise we just sit there short-circuiting with these open loops of information we're trying to remember. I fell for most of these uh, as I was creating this slide. The $10 billion hole too deep to fly over, by the way, is a diamond mine in Russia, and it's so deep that supposedly it creates a vortex and helicopters are prohibited from flying over it because they can get sucked in. And Bigfoot skull is a rock, Neanderthals, no, they didn't die because they didn't have jackets. <laughs> now those loops are closed. Oh, except for the Will Smith one. He doesn't know how to feel because it's just a rumor. It's not even true, so don't worry about it. So in considering the other person's or the group's attention when you are presenting your research, your information, just have in your mind moment of truth, best time and place, and also how can I stimulate curiosity about this topic that I'm gonna talk about. The next key force of influence is just ease. Ease is way more important than we realize if we want to talk about behavior rather than just the decision and the motivation. And to give you an alligator example. Anybody ever been to Gatorland in Orlando? Okay, a couple of people. This place, you guys, it's creepy, it's freaky, it's awesome. There are 3,000 alligators. 3,000 alligators, and they're in piles like this. And one of the things that you can do when you're there is you can buy meat to feed them. You can buy hot dogs, and you can throw, up, throw a chunk of hot dog into this pile of prehistoric monsters. And I was so excited to do this and see them roiling and writhing and fighting each other over this chunk of meat. But it turns out what happens is alligators are really, really, really lazy. And the chunk of hot dog has to fall within reach of their mouth, and they're not gonna move their body. <laughs> so if it falls right there, they'll snap it. And if it falls one inch away, it just sits there until a bird comes down and gets it. <laughs> Alligators. Alligator brain, really, 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 really freaking lazy. And this explains why many of the companies that have disrupted not just rising above their competitors, but changed entire industries, have revolutionized the ease with which we can do business with them. Pleasure and pain is important for motivation, but ease and difficulty has a much greater impact on behavior. Think about Amazon, making it super, 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 super easy to get anything at all delivered to your house. Is it the cheapest? Is it the best? No, I don't know, but it's really, really easy. Right, Uber makes it easy, 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 easy as possible to get a ride. 
lots of times you don't even know how much it costs, right? It's not that it's cheap, it's not that it's the most amazing ride, but it's so easy. And if you're single, Tinder, super, 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 super easy, right? To give a signal that you like someone and set up a date. For some people, swiping right with their thumb is not even easy enough. And one engineer created this right swiping robot. <laughs> this is how lazy people are. Domino's understands how lazy people are. And they had a fantastic campaign last year, which was, the idea was just, let's make it as easy as possible to order a pizza. Let's take out all the friction. Let's take out all the friction. You can tweet us an order. You can call us. You can order on your Apple Watch. You can text us an order. If you had a particular kind of Ford, you could order pizza from your car. They made it as easy as possible. And in one year, their share price went up 12% while Pizza Hut went down 2%. They didn't change their pizza. They just made it easy. Ladies, what behavior do we desire to encourage related to this household object? We want our guys to put the seat down, right? We don't understand why they flush it and leave. And we remind them, put the seat down, put the seat down. We have so many fights over this. So this is a brilliant design of a toilet. Hello, alligator brain, by the way, right? Brilliant design of a toilet because you can't flush it without putting the seat down. So I encourage you to think about next time you're trying to persuade someone, don't stop at getting them to want to do that thing. How could you possibly make it as easy as it could be and reduce the friction as much as possible so they can take action on that decision as well? And this video shows you a beautiful example of a moment of truth and at the same time making it as easy as possible to take action. Check it out. love it. I don't expect to ever think of any campaign as cool and creative as that. But you don't have to think of something that's secret and hidden and magical with transparent paint. Just consider what's the best time and place if you're trying to sell beach vacations to people in Hong Kong, obviously monsoon season, and then even especially when it rains, right? And the fact that these, these ads are just appearing on the sidewalk like magic, Alligator brain, hello, surprise, attention, curiosity, and then makes it easy to take action with the QR code. The next force of influence that I encourage you to play with is very, very common in sales, and we've all been uh, on the receiving end of scarcity ploys many, 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 many times. Scarcity operates through loss aversion, and when someone tells you there's limited time or limited quantity, 
or something is very exclusive, loss aversion kicks in and you say, you don't tell me what to do, I've gotta have that thing. I've gotta have it, I've gotta have it, I've gotta have it. And sometimes scarcity can lead to remorse and regret, buyer's remorse. Anybody ever bought anything on sale that you regretted later? Yeah, laughing, like yeah, if your hand is up, you're just lying, if it's not up, you're lying. Um, this is because scarcity. So first there's the anchoring when something's on sale, right? Like, oh, there's the regular price, what a good deal that I get the sale price, but sales never last forever, so you've got to jump on it right now. This is a silly example of drugstore circular, of course, limited time offer, because it always is, and, but the silly part of it is that they use scarcity telling you, you can't buy more than six bottles of fish oil and five bottles of dish soap. Were you gonna buy seven bottles of fish oil? No, right? But scarcity still works when you end up buying two instead of one. And temporal scarcity isn't just a gimmicky kind of transactional sales thing that pharmacists use, even in international diplomacy. Diplomats use the scarcity principle when they say to another country, here's the deal that we can offer you now under the current regime. When the regime changes, who knows? Might not be so good. Same principle, limited time. Exclusivity or actually this is both exclusivity and limited quantity, um, is the second principle of scarcity. And anybody ever had Kopi Luwak coffee? This is the most expensive coffee in the whole entire world. One back there, one right here, over here. Y'all are disgusting. <laughs> They're like, I know, I've had it too because I fall for all of this stuff even though I teach it. Kopi Lua coffee <laughs> is limited in quantity because it's limited by the number of civet cats, this little creature, who are available to eat the coffee berries and poop them out before they get roasted and turned into Kopi Lua coffee and sold for, ladies and gentlemen, $100 a pound. Why? Why have we eaten this pooped out coffee? because it's cool, there's hardly any of it. It's exotic, it's exclusive, it's in limited supply. My experience was not that it tasted any different from any other type of coffee, and hopefully they burn out all of that whatever yucky stuff was in there, but it's insane. This talk was sponsored by Gatorland, obviously. Gatorland uses, not really, Gatorland uses the scarcity principle when they tell you, we have four white crocodiles, but not just limited quantity of four, there are only 12 white cro crocodiles, sorry, alligators, alligators, I mix them up, sorry, Florida people. There are only 12 white alligators in the whole entire world, and four of them are at Gatorland. You've never even heard of a white alligator, maybe, but when you're at Gatorland, like, oh my God, this is so cool. Four of the 12 in the world. Scarcity is also the mechanism behind playing hard to get and why that works. This is a psychology study which didn't need to be run because we all know that hard to get works, but here's how it went. They recruited a bunch of Harvard female undergrads who were straight and they said, please share your Facebook profile with us and we're gonna share your profile with some men and they'll tell us what they think of you and then you'll come into the lab and we'll show you their profiles and you'll tell us what you think of them. Of course, it's a psychology experiment. The men don't actually exist. They're randomized profiles and pictures are all switched around, etc. So the women come in and they say, okay, researchers say, here's guy number one, and he likes you. Here's guy number two. He likes you a lot. Guy number three, he's unsure of his feelings about you. So, okay, take a look. Guy number one, guy number two, guy number three, read their profile and tell us what you think of them. And the women do, and they say, guy number two, <laughs> he likes me a lot, and I like him, but guy number three, oh my God, I love him! <laughs> the scarcity principle, exclusivity. Think about for yourself and your own presentations and your own research, how can you employ the scarcity principle 
perhaps limited time, limited quantity, and also exclusivity. Is it new information? Is it proprietary information? Is it information that not many people know? Is it controversial information, right? How can you convey a sense of scarcity even in a situation where it's not necessarily limited in time, not necessarily limited in quantity? The next technique, super simple, it's labeling. If you've been following the election at all, you've heard a lot of labeling, and Donald Trump is the master at it. Labeling is just giving a name to the behavior that you wish to encourage or discourage. You can name a person, you can name a behavior, name a thing, to draw people toward it or push them away from it. So when Donald Trump calls Hillary Clinton crooked Hillary and it sticks, this is labeling in action. And Hillary Clinton has been fighting against that for months, right? It's very persuasive just because it's a label. Here are a couple more examples. Here's a research study because I know y'all are nerds like me. This was a classic study done at an elementary school where the psychology researchers are in cahoots with the principal and the teachers and the custodians. They divide the classrooms in half and in the ele this elementary school, like every other one, kids are just messy. Do you have small children, anyone besides me? Like being neat and tidy is not at the top of their list. It's not like they hate it, but it's just not top of mind. So they leave their trash all over the classrooms. And in half of the classrooms, the teachers, the principal, the custodian, remind the students, they just remind the students, hey, y'all, you should be neat and tidy. And because the kids weren't trying not to be, the reminder is effective and they throw away twice as much trash. But the interesting part is in the labeling condition where they name the behavior, they name the students neat and tidy. When they say you are neat and tidy, then the students throw away more than five and a half times as much trash because their behavior conforms with that label and that identity. Of course, it's only going to work if the person thinks that this is a positive identity, right? But you can also have negative labels like Crooked Hillary, and I'll show you a couple in a second. Here's another study in a school um, which has now been rolled out because it's so effective. It's been rolled out by the USDA across elementary schools across the country, which is labeling foods to make them sound tastier and students take them and eat them more. They label healthy foods. Like if you just take a basket of oranges and put a sign on it that says fresh Florida oranges, then it increases, oops, increases uptake by up to 26%. Simple, simple, simple. Of course they're fresh oranges. We get most of our oranges from Florida. You're not giving any more information, but just the label of fresh or Florida oranges makes it more appealing to our alligator brain. Here's a negative label from marketing. You might not know that the phrase, often a bridesmaid but never a bride, was coined by a marketing person at Listerine in 1924. Imagine, and this is in ads targeted toward young single women, obviously. Imagine yourself as a young single woman in 1924. What would your worst, 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 worst nightmare be? Growing old and single and no man ever loves you and you're just all alone with your cats. Except that that's not even as bad as growing old and single, no man to love you, all alone with your cats, and standing up at the altar after friend, after friend, after friend goes and lives the life of your dreams. If all you have to do to prevent your worst, 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 worst nightmare from coming true is buy mouthwash, obviously you gotta buy mouthwash, right? And Listerine is still around. Here's another negative label. That's one for your alligator brain. <laughs> Hi, alligator brains. <laughs> Moving on. So think about what labels or what categories you want to create to move people toward or move people away from the desired behavior. The final one, this 
Um, I'm calling it hot potato, but understand, this is just between us. There's no one out in the world that calls it hot potato. Moments of truth, yes, that's a thing. Hot potato, no. <laughs> but it helps you remember the concept, which is when faced with resistance, rather than pushing back against the resistance, giving, giving it back to them as a problem to solve. For example, you are making a presentation or pitching an idea, and it's just as simple as reflecting the question back. They tell you, yeah, we're not really interested right now. Rather than saying, oh, and going away. <laughs> rather than saying why, which actually can be slightly aggressive and put people on the spot, it's just reflecting the question back, saying, you're not really interested right now. And hot potato is a way to get, get information more easily than you would have gotten otherwise that you didn't have before. This is a much better illustration. And this, if you just took one little technique away from this talk, the next one is it, which is the magic question. I want to illustrate it with a story that was told to us by Gloria Steinem when she came and visited my hometown earlier this year. And she's an American feminist, many of you are familiar with her. She told us a story about being on a trip to Africa where the topic of concern was sexual slavery and girls being sold into sexual slavery. And she went to go visit a village after she arrived and she's meeting with the tribal elders. And they're talking about these girls and the magic question, so simple, is just what would it take? Rather than proposing her own ideas for how to fight sexual slavery in this village in Africa, she just asks the tribal leaders, what would it take for those three girls not to have left the village last year? And they said, an electric fence. This is not something she would have thought of. <laughs> and she says, an electric fence? And they say, yes, because the elephants are trampling our crops of maize. We can't keep them out, and our food supplies are being destroyed, and we don't have enough food, and we don't have enough money to send our girls to school. So Gloria Steinem goes back to the States. She raises a few thousand dollars, sends it back to the village, and she returns again three years later. And at least as she tells the story, there's singing and there's dancing, there's plenty of food and no girls have left the village. This is the power of the magic question. What would it take? You can use this in almost any situation. I use it even negotiating with my eight-year-old daughter who is the most hard-nosed negotiator I've ever, ever met. But you can use this with anyone and I encourage you to. So just between us, hot potato is the name of it. But in life, giving the problem or handing the objection back to the other person is what we're talking about here. So to review, we've covered attention. Your gator brain handles anything unless it's new and surprising, then kicks it up to the court. Talked about moments of truth, open loops, and the Zygarnik effect. I left you with an open loop, by the way. Did you notice this? We'll close it in a sec. We talked about ease for influencing behavior, how ease trumps motivation. We talked about scarcity, which could be limited time, limited quantity, and exclusivity. By the way, if you're taking pictures, I'm happy to share slides. I'll give you my email address. And we talked about labeling, which could be positive or negative. And then finally, hot potato, giving it back to them. And in particular, the magic question, what would it take? To help your gator brain put this into memory. That looks a little bit weird. Here you go. If you want to guide a gator, it helps to have a leash. <laughs> Closing the open loop. I asked you about M&Ms. And we asked a lot of other people about M&Ms. In the study that we ran, we said, for each of these conditions, do you think people will eat more or do you think people will eat less? Numeric serving size. And across all conditions, there was a lot of disagreement. But in general, people said, yeah, I think it would help if I saw how many p 
pieces were in a serving size. And they said, I think it would really help a lot if I got to see the picture. That would help, that would be the best. And with portions, they were like, yeah, well, maybe, but I might grab 10 and put them in my purse, <laughs> right? What we found was this. No effect at all of the label with the number of pieces. No effect at all of the label with the visual serving size and a tremendous effect of the portions. This is my interpretation of those results. Labels do not count, they are not persuasive unless you pay attention to them. And because of how the alligator brain works, most of the information in life that we are exposed to, we are really truly not paying attention at all. And ease trumps motivation. So it was easiest to get a whole cup of M&Ms if there's a cup, and easiest to get one pack of M&Ms if they're in packs. Remember our deal from the beginning? What kind of animal is this? It's an alligator, <laughs> not a crocodile. Thank you. I'd be happy to share. Thank you. I'm happy to share slides and other fun resources on influence if you're curious. You can email me at influenceprof at gmail.com. I have nothing to sell you, I promise. And just remember, if you want to guide a gator, it helps to have a leash. Thank you. <laughs>